She's one of the largest ships sailing our oceans. She's as tall as a 10-story building. And in a year, she travels two-thirds the distance to the moon. Well, it's his job to keep out of my way, but it's not moving. In 12 months, she carries nearly 200,000 containers, a cargo worth $4.5 billion, cargo that must be delivered intact and on time. Yet this huge ship has a crew of only 22 who have to be ready for any conditions, any emergency. All your personnel to your boat station. See any lights? And must be ready to defend their ship against desperate marauders, modern day pirates. The Atlanta's mission, transporting and protecting a mountain of very valuable cargo. Come experience life aboard a maritime megastructure. Witness the mechanics and machinations of life at sea. Okay, I'll go ahead, thank you. Have a thank you. And visit the bustling ports that feed the ever-growing world of trade. Welcome aboard the OOCL Atlanta, a mega ship, a true giant of the ocean. The Atlanta is one of the latest and largest class of container ships. Known as Post Panamax, she and her kind are too wide to sail through the Panama Canal. If she were a naval vessel, she'd be the equivalent of an aircraft carrier with a crew of several thousand men. The Atlanta has a crew of just 22 ranging from a handful of ordinary seamen who work to keep the Atlanta ship shape at all times. Five engineers keep the ship's engines, power plants, and operating systems up and running. And a team of four officers work in shifts around the clock. Junior officers stand watch and keep a close eye on the weather. Second officer, Law, is responsible for navigation and communications. First Officer Jonathan oversees all the crew, the safety, and daily running of the ship and all cargo load. At the team's head is a captain who's spent all his working life at sea. Starboard 10. Starboard 10. Captain Roger Llewellyn is a man with salt water coursing through his veins. And over the years, he's developed some interesting sleeping habits. One eye open. Always. We sleep with one eye open because at 25, 26 knots, you've got to jump out and up there. Up there is the bridge, and that's where the sailor who never sleeps has spent most of his last 30 years. He's sailed every ocean on the planet and visited every nation that borders the sea. Right now, the Atlanta is in the Malacca Straits, heading from Port Kalang, Malaysia, to Singapore then north to Hong Kong. It's a hectic schedule on a crowded route. Zero five zero. Zero five zero. A lot of traffic not doing what they're supposed to do, a lot of traffic not reporting. So you've got to have eyes at the back of your head. You've got to keep an eye out for everything moving, especially small coastal traffic. We've got one here, not reported, you see. He's trying to get across the bow. When the Atlanta blows her horn, you'd be well advised to move out of her way. Her vital statistics are staggering. From bow to stern, the Atlanta is 323 meters long. That's over a thousand feet. In fact, if you could tip the Atlanta up on her bow, she'd edge out the Eiffel Tower. The area of her top deck is greater than two football fields. Fully laden, the Atlanta weighs more than 300 jumbo jets. On her normal route, she carries cargo from Southeast Asia to the west coast of America and back again every 42 days. These ocean giants make the Earth very small. It is a village, because one minute we're in the east, next minute we're in the west. 
very little time between the two. So we're constantly plying the world with manufactured goods. Mega ships like the Atlanta help keep the wheels of global commerce turning. Over half the world's cargo is carried in containers. In one year, nearly 20 million containers are moved a total of 300 million times. It's a payload worth almost $5 trillion. The Atlanta may be loaded down, but she still has to be on time. She runs to schedule for thousands and thousands of miles. She'll arrive on time. In Singapore, containers are arriving from all around the region. Some have a date with the Atlanta. These transfers must be planned with military precision. It's a chain where a weak link means a cargo gets delayed, or even worse, lost. The bottom line, the cargo must be at port waiting when the Atlanta docks. Two particular pieces of cargo due for the Atlanta started their journey several thousand kilometers away in Australia. One is precious and fragile. A shipment of 999 cartons of wine from the lush vineyards of South Australia. The other is also a gourmet delight, but this time highly perishable. A container load of sweet succulent prawns. Both the wine and seafood are bound for shops and restaurants in Hong Kong, and both will require extreme care and constant supervision. The Atlanta's due in Singapore in less than 24 hours, but there's a problem. Third mate. Yes, that's correct, over. Third mate. Yeah, I'll see Atlanta, the master here. I sent it yesterday and I sent it again this morning when I left Port Calais. Okay, uh, so okay. Port procedures are very strict. Yeah. I give up. Without the right paperwork, ships can't enter a country's waters. Good mate, keep him there, tell him. Instead of the last 10 ports which you've already got, I'll just send you Port Calais. OK, no problem, no problem. Aye, aye. The captain must keep to schedule. He has 2,200 containers to move in Singapore. And he must get there on time. The Atlanta is steaming towards Singapore Harbor and the planned 2,200 container moves. This megaship is purpose-built for one thing only, to carry cargo. A mountain of cargo. All up, she can carry 8,063 20-foot containers. These are the lashing bars and the turn muffles up. These are 20-foot. You can load 20, then you can load 40, either or. But they still need lashing forward and aft. Keep them fixed in position. Even though she hasn't yet reached her full load capacity, the captain still likes to check on the containers from the top to the very bottom. Where we are now, we're 13.6 meters underwater now. Down here, the containers are stacked nine high. So they go nine high, and then on deck, another six to eight high. So roughly, we're stacking 17 high. From the very bottom of the stack, over 13 meters below the water, the containers rise over 44 meters. On land, it would look like a city block rising 10 stories. If laid end to end, those containers would stretch further than an Olympic marathon nearly 50 kilometers. A little over 40 years ago, it was a different story. Products like wine would have been transported in a variety of simple boxes, and moving frozen foods over long distances was simply out of the question. Then, in the late 50s, an American, Malcolm McLean, came up with an idea that would revolutionize world trade by packing all goods into modular containers similar in design and dimension. They could be easily transported anywhere in the world 
by road, rail, or sea. As the use of these containers has grown, so has the size of the ships that carry them. The Atlanta is one of 12 SX-class ships built for OOCL by the Samsung Shipyard in Korea. It took over 8,000 workers nearly nine months to build her at a cost of over $150 million. She is the largest ship ever ever built when she was contract. And uh, she had been installed the largest main engine when uh, available in that time. For the engine power that he was given, for the speed he wants, he's done, a, for me, a great job. When first launched, the SX class held the world record as the largest container ship ever built. We used the high tensile steel to get the minimum light ship weight so that we can maximize the cargo loading capability. It's that combination of high tensile steel and the design of the hull that gives the Atlanta her enormous load carrying ability. This that runs the full length of the ship is a very important structural member for stresses because you must remember there's so many big openings that the ship is bending all the time. In this area, when you've got 95,000 horsepower pushing this ship, the pressure is enormous. You can see that the, the frame structure is very heavy. So this is a high stress area, especially in heavy weather. The real pride of the Atlanta is the power plant. This is one of the world's biggest diesel engines. A 12-cylinder turbocharged monster its sheer size is breathtaking. The engine fills a room six stories high, six stories of incredible power. The engine peaks at 104 revolutions per minute, but generates a mind-blowing 93,120 brake horsepower. That's over 700 times more power than an average family car. And all that power adds up to one thing, speed through the water. She can average nearly 25 nautical miles an hour. That's fast enough to water ski behind, as long as you can handle that huge stern wash. While at sea, the Atlanta can notch up over 570 nautical miles a day. But a speed like that comes at a price. This ship, she burns a lot of fuel. Full speed, she'll burn 230, 240 tons a day. That's a staggering 10 tons of diesel every hour the ship is underway. She may be thirsty, but she's also a clean engine. And that starts with clean fuel. A series of filters remove impurities before the diesel is pumped into a holding tank and heated to 129 degrees. Hot fuel and gas is an explosive mix. Number seven cargo hold, number seven cargo hold, the fire alarm's gone off. No other sound strikes fear into the heart of the mariner like the fire alarm. Starboard side, bay one, starboard side. Let me know A fire at sea can spell disaster. A small spark can soon become a fireball. The crew have to be ready to act in an instant. In the ocean, you're on your own. You've got nobody. We've got no shore facilities, no emergency services. We just rely on our own training and our own emergency services. But a fire is the worst. In an emergency like this, First Mate Jonathan rallies the crew the captain calls the shots. We are now proceeding forward for investigation. Aye, aye. And on deck, on deck. Please. Getting it right can mean the difference between survival and disaster. 
All doors are ready. Okay, I'm going to start the emergency fire pump. Hang on with that. The crew have to work together closely. When the emergency pumps come on, they come on strong. Seawater is pumped onto a fire at a rate of over 4,000 liters per minute through high pressure hoses. Training every Saturday afternoon, two hours of training every Saturday. We have uh, fire drills, forward galley accommodation all over the ship. Within a space of three months, we'll have covered every part of the ship in a fire drill. And 95% of all fires at sea are in the engine room. Maybe down at the CO2 room, the CO2 room, you read over. No copy. Each week, the Atlantis crew carry out an intensive fire drill. A fire in the engine room is the most dangerous of all and cannot be fought with water. Fighting an engine room fire requires a different strategy. This room is filled with hundreds of bottles of carbon dioxide, which can be directed automatically to the engine room via a network of sprinkler systems, starving the fire of oxygen. The Atlanta has been powering her way towards Singapore with Captain Llewellyn determined to keep her on schedule. The Atlanta's ability to maintain her top speed is thanks to her revolutionary propeller. This 85-ton, six-bladed piece of molded alloy spinning at just 104 revolutions per minute provides enough thrust to drive her forward at 25 knots. Sitting behind that propeller is a huge rudder that plunges nearly 12 meters below the surface of the waves. It's roughly the same size as a double-decker bus. And with a surface area like that, the captain doesn't want it angled for too long. A rudder at an angle causes drag, which slows the ship down. You need to keep the rudder movements to a minimum. So I like just to keep her within one degree on either side, but that depends on the sea conditions. Big swells, big following sea, you can't do that. At the moment, the sea conditions are perfect for steering a straight line to Singapore. ETA, 0700 hours. The first sign that the Atlanta's getting closer to port is the sudden increase in sea traffic. One, two, three, four, five, six. One of the problems with being a giant is avoiding the dwarves of the ocean. For the captain, arrival at port is one of the most stressful parts of the journey. He has to be ready to react in an instant. Well, it's his job to keep out of my way, but he's not moving, you see. He's still coming across. Now he's going round. Now he's going to come across my stern. It's going to be a long day for the captain and his crew. Getting into port is just the first hurdle. It's the end of, not the end of the working day, but it's it's because uh, we got cargo work straight away after. But it's. Uh, it's the end of the problems in the uh, Singapore Straits. So we can relax a little. Engine tested head on a stern. While the captain maneuvers the Atlanta carefully closer to port, 2,500 kilometers away, another key individual is frantically working behind the scenes. Eric Lee is the ship planner. At the head office in Hong Kong, he's using the latest in sophisticated cargo planning software. He calls all the shots when it comes to loading the Atlanta's 8,000 containers and must make sure that every piece of cargo is ready and waiting. A miscalculation could prove costly. The worst thing is the ship is sitting at the terminal, berthing at the terminal without any work. We lost a lot. Eric isn't the only one who has to get his planning right. Captain Llewellyn must get to the port on time. But before he gets there, the busy waterways are going to get even busier. 
It's time to call in the assistance of a local expert, the pilot. Every harbor has its own secrets. Fast currents, changing tides, shallow waters. In a tricky maneuver, the Atlanta is about to pick up the man who knows these waters like the back of his hand. Zamil Nair has been a pilot in Singapore port for over 20 years. Well, we trust him, but you've got to watch what he's doing. So it's uh, until you actually tied up, you can't relax. Bringing this mega ship into dock is the most dangerous maneuver of any trip. Dead slow at the moment. The chain of command is strict and involves as many as 12 key individuals. Now with that, Thank you, Thank you brother. Uh, basically, uh, I'm working closely with the captain, ship's captain, and he's using my expertise in ship handling and uh, local knowledge to get the ship alongside. Okay, 314, steady, sir. Thank you. Dead slow, eh? Dead slow, eh? Uh, sea Labrador, pile Labrador. We've got a tug coming out there. It's going to be made fast at the stern on the port quarter. Uh, this tug is about uh, 4,000 horsepower and it's a fairly big, powerful tug. So basically, I'm going to swing the ship around to starboard and then backing down into the berth. Stop engines. Stop. Stop. Engine. With main engines stopped, the tugboat Labrador is tied to the stern of the Atlanta on the port side. Then it's dead slow ahead. Atlanta bridge, gangway ready. Okay, Tango 1, uh, we'll see how. Uh, Tango 1, Tango 1. We'll be starboard side, long side, uh, bridge to bow. Two four nine meters. Two four nine. Okay, I see one of your crane is down. Eh? Can you check on the crane, please? Okay, okay. Bigger the ship, the smaller the space, pilot. Yep. Bigger the ship, the yep. smaller the space. Stop engines. Stop engine. Okay, Labrador, increase the pull power. Yeah. At the stern is the Labrador, a four thousand horsepower tug. Up front, the Atlanta's huge electric-driven bow thruster adds another 3,350 horsepower. All up, the pilot has over 7,000 horsepower at his command. By combining the pull of the Labrador at the stern and the power of the bow thruster, the pilot cleverly spins the Atlanta into position. When the spinning is over, it's time for some precision parking. It's the ultimate shoehorning exercise. That's slow. That's slow. There's no margin for error. The Atlanta is 323 meters long. She's being parked in a space with only meters to spare. Stop engines. Stop engines. What have you got for it now? How much? Five meters, Five meters, is that all? So keep the after spring slack. Okay. Keep, keep spring it. slack as we come astern. Yeah, Even though they perform this operation hundreds of times a year, it's a tense time for all the crew. Forward spring now, all the way forward. Two meters, two meters. Should be on the road in a minute. Position. In position, hold her now, hold her, hold her on your spring. Another successful docking for the captain and Nair, the pilot. And the moment the Atlanta docks, things swing into action as the trucks line up for loading and unloading. Singapore is one of the largest container terminals in the world, handling 17% of the world's total container trade. In 2004, over 20 million 20-foot containers passed through the port of Singapore. For every single ship, every minute in port counts. A total of four giant cranes start moving the Atlanta's containers at breakneck speed. The pressure is on.
The Atlanta has 2,200 containers that need to be moved, and the captain's hoping it can be done in under 20 hours. This is where Eric's cargo planning is really put to the test. He has to pre-plan every move and allocate each container a specific position on the ship. No container should be moved twice. Double handling wastes time and money. So containers due to be unloaded at the next port must be stacked close to the top, while a container bound for America needs to be stacked deeper in the hole. The other major concern is keeping the ship balanced during loading. Too much weight on either side of the ship could put it in danger of capsizing. It's Jonathan, the first mate's job, to keep a close eye on the Atlanta during this critical time. His computer monitors the distribution of weight around the ship and also allows him to compensate for any uneven loading. Deep in the ship's hull are a network of giant ballast tanks. By moving hundreds of tons of seawater between these tanks, Jonathan can keep the Atlanta on an even keel. To complicate this balancing act even further, the ship has to take on fuel. The Atlantis tanks can hold over seven and a half million liters of diesel. This is a job for an expert. Bunker boats are the floating petrol stations of the port. This is the only time the Atlanta will take on diesel for the round trip from Asia to America. Today, they're taking on nearly 7,000 tons. It's an operation that will take over six hours. With the price of fuel around 280 US dollars a ton, this little trip to the gas station will cost the captain nearly $2 million. While the engine shut down, Alvin, the second engineer, can check out the crankcase. There are certain advantages to working on an engine this big. It's not often a man can stand inside a crankcase to check for loose bolts or undo wear on any of the moving parts. When a cylinder has a bore of nearly a meter and the piston has a stroke of 2.4 meters, any wear is going to cause serious trouble. Among the 2,200 containers being moved today are the two that started their journey two weeks ago in Australia. The container carrying the latest vintage of Australian Chardonnay needs to be moved quickly, but also with care. The last containers to be loaded on board are the refrigerated containers. These reefers are carrying perishable goods. The one carrying the Australian frozen seafood has to be kept at a temperature of minus 18 degrees throughout the entire journey. Jonathan, the first mate, hooks them up to the ship's power supply in order to get the refrigeration units working as soon as possible. While on board, the crew will check their temperatures twice a day, every day. Below decks, the crew go on a manhunt. At dock, there's always the risk of taking on extra cargo, human cargo. Stowaways looking for a free ride to the USA. Stowaways have been known to climb mooring ropes at night and are sometimes even hiding inside the containers. If they get on board, they pose a real security threat. While the crew search for stowaways down below, up on the bridge, the officers are planning for the sea voyage ahead. It's the second mate's responsibility to plot the course. It's an intricate combination of old world tradition and new age technology. He does his initial plotting using charts, slide rule, and compass, and then transfers the data into a computer. The advanced software then links his data to the satellite navigation systems and radar. 
The result? The officers on the bridge can plot the ship's course and see any oncoming traffic, all in real time. Well, the beauty of that for me is you see where you are instantly. You see exactly where the ship is. And as many times I have to be on my own, so I need to know where she is. A ship of this size, when she's drawing 13.6, 14 meters, we need to know exactly where she is. The search for stowaways below deck is complete, and the crew have given the bridge the all clear. Nearly 22 hours after first docking, all of the new containers are on board and are being secured for the long trip to Hong Kong. Each container is lashed to the rows above and below in a matrix which locks every single container rigidly in place. This ensures that none of the cargo, including those bottles of Australian wine, will shift if the Atlanta starts pitching in a storm at sea. A full two hours later than planned, but with all cargo on board and firmly secured, the Atlanta is ready to leave Singapore. Taking a giant out of port can be even more difficult than bringing one in. And of course, that clock has started ticking again. Coming in and out of port, we're under more stress than when we're sailing out in the open sea. And we got deadlines to meet, sailing schedules. He wants us there at a certain time, we can't get there. And it all adds to your level of stress. Hey, chips. Hey, chips. As with arrival, Captain Llewellyn shares command with Zamil Nair, the pilot. In these confined waters, the bow thrusters get a full-blown workout. Nair uses all his experience, first reversing the Atlanta before the tugboat with all of her 4,000 horsepower helps spin the Atlanta away from the docks and points her in the right direction. Steady as she goes. Single four, pilot, single four. Steady, steady, steady. With the Atlanta slowly increasing speed and safely on her way, Nair now needs to meet up with another incoming ship. It's a transfer that involves a hair-raising climb, followed by a brave leap to the pilot boat, all at a speed of over eight knots. One slip could be his last. By his calculations, it's a leap of faith that he performs as many as eight times in one working day. Once the Atlanta is out in open waters, Captain Llewellyn resumes sole command of his megaship. It will take the Atlanta two and a half days to sail to Hong Kong from Singapore, traveling a distance of over 1,460 nautical miles. That's a lot of time at sea. Time that's taken up with regular maintenance and a strict timetable. You must have a routine. You're keeping yourself ready and waiting for the next challenge. Once a week, Captain Llewellyn, the first mate, and the bosun carry out inspections of every section of the Atlanta's living quarters. Home entertainment here, Chief, mate. Home from home. Home from home. For the captain, the giant can only run efficiently if attention is paid to every tiny detail. That applies to every inch of the ship. While the crew's quarters are checked, the crew themselves have their own inspections to carry out. Electricity is crucial for all the ship's operating systems. The engineers are responsible for keeping all five 3,000 kilowatt generators running smoothly. Without them, the Atlanta would be dead in the water. The refrigerated containers also rely on electricity. The crew have to check the temperature of every single reefer twice a day. It's a full-time job. keep perishables like the Australian seafood in tip-top condition. 
And guess what? The Atlanta can carry over 700 of these refrigerated units. Although the Atlanta is surrounded by water, none of it, of course, is drinkable. Every drop of fresh water on board is made by turning seawater into drinking water. The ship's desalination plant can treat 30,000 liters a day, but it has to be cleaned regularly. Salt builds up on plates, which have to be stripped, cleaned, and put back into operation quickly. Another thing that's crucial to life on board is food, plenty of it and it has to be kept fresh. The Atlanta has its own mini reefers in the living section. This is the bedroom. This cookie looks after everything absolutely perfect. It's one of the best I've been with. It sets everything out, it rotates, it keeps his storerooms immaculate. A key member of the crew who's hardly seen and seldom heard, but is crucial for harmony on board, is the cook. He orders and prepares all the food and has to come up with a menu that'll keep all 22 men of varied cultural backgrounds happy. 22 meals three times a day, seven days a week. And he does the washing up. For the captain, Sharing meals with the crew is about far more than just the food. One of the beauties is to bring them all together, to sit down and eat together. And you make them feel part of the team. If you don't have a team, you can forget this life. You must work as a team. If there's ever a time when a good team spirit is needed, it's tonight. The ship is entering dangerous waters the security level has been raised. The South China Seas are busy with all sorts of craft. Many are small fishing boats miles from shore. Some, however, may not be at all interested in fishing. Pirates trawl these waters, looking for the ultimate catch. Heading on 308, sir. Well, they're there. You don't know where they are, but they're there. They're watching all the time. So it's, it's a threat. We know that threat. Official figures show there can be three pirate attacks every two weeks in these waters. Third mate, I've got two targets here. And these guys that come aboard, if they can get aboard, they're ruthless. They'll kill for the US dollar. Modern pirates don't wear eye patches and don't carry daggers between their teeth. Today, they carry machine guns, AK-47s and M16s, and travel in high-powered speedboats. Three, five, two, three miles. We're a soft target, we're easy. We're not armed, we're just easy. They know that. Starboard 20. Starboard 20. Hello aft, hello aft. Bridge number one mechanic reporting. Yeah, this is bridge here. We've got a target now. He's moving at 32 knots. He's coming down the port side. If you see anything, let me know. This is the captain. All crew members to your pirate stations. All crew members to your pirate stations. The crew have to be ready to defend their ship. The pirates have one of two aims either to take the crew hostage, or more commonly, to steal any money or valuables that might be on board. The pirate's strategy, attack the ship's blind spot. They head for the aft deck. This is the lowest part of the ship and the most vulnerable. As I'm taking evasive action now, I'm going port 20, I'm going port 20, midships, midships. If the captain can't outmaneuver the marauders, their only defense, high-pressured water cannons. Their only hope, washing the attackers into the sea before the pirates can get aboard. Luckily for the crew, tonight turned out to be another close call. 
the fast-moving vessel was just a fishing boat crossing paths with the Atlanta. But if it's not one threat, it's another. The wind is freshening. The seas are rising. Intense tropical storms of the typhoon season command respect and demand a response. The captain can either skirt the storms, burning more fuel and losing time, or take them head on. This time, he decides to take the risk. No matter the weather, the crew still have to attend to their duties. The reefers still have to be checked, even if it means braving winds up to 70 knots. It's in conditions like these that the power supply to the reefers could fail, spelling disaster for our precious cargo of Australian seafood. At the moment, the reefers are still working. Storms can severely reduce visibility, but heavy rain also plays havoc with navigation equipment. The squalls create unreadable blotches on the radar screen. The danger, there are times when the crew of the Atlanta are almost sailing blind. The Atlanta is weathering the storm, which is losing intensity. The captain's instinct was right, and his gamble to take on the storm is paying off. But now, she still has to make Hong Kong by midnight. The rest of her journey depends on it. It'll take the Atlanta 42 days to complete the full circuit from Southeast Asia to California and back again. It's a mega trip, even for a mega ship. In a year, the Atlanta sails over 260,000 kilometers, which is roughly two thirds the distance to the moon. Five miles to go next one, five miles. Three. Yes. Our megaship, the size of an aircraft carrier, now has to navigate Hong Kong's congested waters. Starboard then. At night, the bridge is not only the brains of the ship, it also becomes the Atlanta's eyes and ears. 350, two miles, stop. When a vessel registers on the Atlanta's radar, it's identified by a number and its direction and speed can be tracked by those watching from the bridge. It's another crucial piece of technology that helps a mega ship maneuver gracefully into a mega port. Bringing the Atlanta into another of the world's busiest ports at night means this small crew have to work together with maximum efficiency once again. It's just before midnight. In any 24-hour period, as many as 100 container ships sail into this harbor. The Atlanta is the last of the day. As at all the ports on the Atlanta's route, space at the dock is tight. Container ships bustle for space in this incredibly congested harbor. In a year, over 22,000 container ships move over 20 million 20-foot containers through this port. Once alongside, the winches take up the slack. The last thing anyone wants is two megaships wrestling for space. After more than two weeks of travel, this is the final destination for two particular pieces of cargo. The reefer containing the Australian prawns is whisked off the ship. 
Not far behind is the container packed with 999 cartons of Australian wine. The containers carrying both the prawns and wine reach a cargo warehouse. This is the telling moment. The frozen seafood has passed through the tropics, crossed the equator, and arrived, still frozen after two and a half weeks at sea. By the time the seafood has been unpacked, the Atlanta has taken on her load for America, and fully laden, she sails on. On the bridge, the captain and second mate Law plot the ship's next long journey across the Pacific Ocean. Having made a long and perilous journey of their own, all 999 cases of wine have arrived intact and on time. In a year, the Atlanta will carry over 185,000 containers at an estimated value of over four and a half billion dollars. The Australian seafood and wine are just a tiny fraction of all the goods that this megaship will transport around the globe. The Atlanta won't dock in California for another 10 days, giving some of the crew a chance. System submerged. Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, Miami, they would all be underwater. Melting ice has flooded the oceans. The Arctic ice cap is long gone. Severe weather relentlessly assaults the planet. Record heat, record drought, record flooding. This is not a world we want to get into. Crop failure, mass migration, riots, extinction. Global warming. Two words that often invoke dire predictions of the planet's future. But is this really our destiny? This is the most serious of environmental problems. It's the one that we need to solve now. We head to all corners of the globe. The size of the population has declined. The future doesn't look good. Speak with leading scientists. Coral bleaching events are clearly telling us that reefs are in trouble. And examine the evidence to find out what global warming really means and if rising temperatures can truly make a difference between the world we know today and a world we may not recognize tomorrow. Twenty years ago, climate scientists were discussing whether the Earth was cooling down or warming up. Now, a vast majority of those scientists believe that global warming is real and it's having a dangerous impact on the planet that we inhabit. What caused those scientists to change their minds? What evidence did they uncover? And what have they determined about the future that you need to know? We start here in the ice fields of Patagonia.
sandwiched in the valleys of the Andes Mountains between Chile and Argentina, the Patagonian ice field is the largest expanse of ice outside of Antarctica and Greenland. Covering almost 7,000 square miles and extending all the way to the Pacific Ocean. When I was here in 1998, this this lake was completely full of icebergs. We couldn't even get a we couldn't get our boat to the ice front, and you can see all, most of the icebergs now have melted. Glaciologist Stefan Harrison and his colleagues have studied the ice fields for almost two decades. Here hundreds of glaciers, some more than a half mile thick, have survived many periods of climate warming since the last ice age ripped the earth. But in the last seven years, these glaciers have lost 10% of their mass. 20,000 years ago, this, this valley was m much more uh, covered in ice than it is now. The reason why we think climate change is so significant now, though, it's happening at a, at a historically fast rate. Rapid melting is not happening just to the glaciers of Patagonia. In the United States, one of the nation's most famous landmarks, northern Montana's Glacier National Park, may soon lose the very thing it was named for. Some of these glaciers are five to 8,000 years old, yet they're melting so rapidly they could vanish in my lifetime. Once there were more than 150 glaciers here. Today, there are fewer than 40. As these before and after pictures dramatically show, glaciers that took thousands of years to form are disintegrating in only decades. And it's happening from the Andes to Alaska. I've heard a lot of people say, hey, global warming, bring it on. I live up here in northern Montana. I'll be able to swim in this lake in April. If all it meant was slightly milder winters in the north, you know, probably a lot of people would be for it. But that's not what's at stake. We're talking about remaking the world in very dangerous ways. At the eastern end of the Antarctic Peninsula, a massive ice shelf juts into the ocean. Known as Larsen B, this plate of ice has been in deep freeze for the past 12,000 years. But in the summer of 2002, something unprecedented happens. Larsen B completely collapses. A chunk the size of Rhode Island falls into the sea. Scientists are stunned. Something unusual is happening to ice all over the world. Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> Nicely done. The glaciers of Patagonia are literally melting before Harrison's eyes, carving rivers through the ice, pulling into lakes, tunneling holes that burrow hundreds of feet into the heart of the glacier. Harrison repels into one of these holes to get a closer look at what's happening inside the ice. Harrison is not surprised by what he finds. More water. The, you know, this looks like a, a solid, solid world, but in fact, actually, the, the, all the ice here is melting. The water, there's water running through the bottoms of, the, of these ice caves. You can hear waterfalls in the background. This is a, basically a, a watery landscape, and uh, this ice is actually melting very, very rapidly. To Dr. Harrison, melting ice is the canary in the coal mine, an undeniable sign that global warming is happening now. But ice also tells scientists something else just as crucial, when global warming has occurred in the past. The 
ice is a logbook of the Earth's climate going back hundreds of thousands of years. You can see the ice here is absolutely full of, of, of bubbles, and the bubbles were formed when the ice was formed. Uh, and of course the bubbles contain atmosphere, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Mike Stefan Harrison, Mark Serez studies ice. Don't you lead the way. Here at the National Snow and Ice Data Center in Boulder, Colorado, scientists have preserved thousands of ice cores drilled from deep in the glaciers of Antarctica and the world's second largest concentration of ice, Greenland. These are records of past climate, which in the case of Antarctica extend back more than 600,000 years. So really it's, it's recording 600,000 years of Earth's climate history. Layer after layer of compacted snow contains ancient dust, debris, gas bubbles, all clues to climate behavior. By analyzing this long timeline of climate history, Serez and others can better understand if today's climate behavior is normal or is something very different. Changes that we've seen in the past decade are much too large, much too pronounced now to be simply explained away as just part of a natural cycle. There's something much more fundamental hitting on the climate system now. In the last 100 years, the Earth's temperature has climbed one degree. Could that single degree impact the climate in such dramatic ways? Climate is far from constant. It operates like a complicated machine with many moving parts. Even a slight change in just one of those parts, temperature, sunlight, ocean circulation, can have a domino effect on all the others. So if the temperature goes up or down, it can ripple through the whole system. To put it into perspective, the depths of the ice ages were separated from the period today by only a few degrees in the global average temperature. The ice ages, according to biologist Stephen Bacala, were climate changes brought on by natural cycles. Approximately every 100,000 years, the Earth's orbit becomes slightly more elliptical, taking us further from the sun. When that coincides with other cycles, such as periods when the planet tilts away from the sun, it can cool things down. Those changes trigger a set of mechanisms that cause there to be more or less heat put to different parts of the planet. It doesn't take much to spawn an ice age, just a small drop in the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth. So had New York City existed 160,000 years ago, it would have been on the edge of an ice pack over a mile high. 30,000 years later, it would have been under 20 feet of water. What we need to know, says Dr. Bacala, is that climate change is not always slow or gradual. There's a class of almost instantaneous climate change that I call monsters behind the door. I call them monsters because were they to occur today, they would be catastrophic. Monsters that many scientists fear may be unleashed in the coming decades. January 1, 2006. Across southern Australia, the summer heat blasts its way into the record books. In the capital of Sydney, temperatures top 111 degrees. By the end of January, the most destructive brush fires in 20 years raged throughout the country, killing nine people. After the hottest year on record, the new year brings only more of the same. Yeah, I mean, look how hot this is. This is just amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's hot. In New South Wales, Fire Chief Russell Rees inspects the damage left by a wildfire during what should be Australia's wet season. The severity of the devastation is surprising and alarming. After 30 years in the fire service, Rees is fighting an enemy he no longer recognizes. 
are part of the Australian phenomenon. They've been around for millions of years. What's changing is how the fires behave, the frequency of the fires, and the way that they burn and the things that can change during those fires. After a decade of drought, these grassy hillsides have become the most combustible kind of fuel, deprived of moisture for years. And there's something else that Rees has noticed, something that tells him a greater force is at work than just simply a dry spell. It's also changing the short-term weather patterns, giving us this in volatility, these spikes in the weather that is causing us to go from calm days to very, very blow-up fire condition days just out of the blue extreme heat it's not just happening in australia to the weather now and no surprise it is awful chicago 1995 temperatures over 100 degrees kill 739 people in only five days and in europe 2003 more than 30,000 perish when a record-breaking heat wave grips the continent. Of the 21 hottest years on record, 20 have occurred since 1980. There are some people saying, look, the long history of the planet, it's always had spikes up and down. Climate has changed throughout Earth's history for natural reasons. The difference is that in the future, climate change will come on much faster than any change in the history of civilization. How can experts such as Dr. Michael Oppenheimer be so confident that this current warm-up is unusual? The reason can be found back in the ice core laboratory in Boulder. In layer after layer, going back hundreds of thousands of years, scientists can measure tiny samples of atmospheric gases that have been trapped and preserved. And there's one gas in particular that follows the rise and fall of temperature almost perfectly. When temperatures go up, there is more of it. When temperatures go down, there is less. That gas is carbon dioxide, CO2. And in analysis after analysis, Ceres and his team find something alarming. We find carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere today are higher than anything we've seen in the past 600,000 years. This is telling us that present day climate is very unusual. CO2, carbon dioxide, is not pollution. In fact, it's essential to life on Earth as we know it. Animals exhale it, plants and trees breathe it in. And carbon dioxide plays another vital role on this planet. It's one of the gases in our atmosphere that helps keep the Earth warm. When the sun's energy hits the Earth, some of it is absorbed and some reflected back into space. CO2 traps more of that heat energy and holds it in the atmosphere. That's the greenhouse effect, and it's a good thing, because without that natural greenhouse effect, Earth would be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than it is now. It would be a frozen desert, and humanity would never have developed. All the greenhouse gases together, CO2, methane, water vapor, nitrous oxide, make up only 1% of our atmosphere, not much. But the climate history has shown how even slight changes in the amount of those gases, particularly carbon dioxide, can swing the Earth's climate from one extreme to another. And as scientists have discovered, never since human beings first walked the Earth have carbon dioxide levels been this high. The question is, why? This is the Amazon. More than a million and a half square miles of rainforest, roughly the size of the continental United States. It's famous for its striking beauty and the diversity of life that calls the forest home. The 
Amazon also plays a less obvious, more critical role in the health of the entire planet. The billions of trees here and in forests around the world absorb carbon dioxide on a massive scale, hoping to keep levels in check. Without them, a lot more carbon dioxide would remain in the atmosphere. What we need to know, say Amazon researchers, is that the CO2 now flooding into the atmosphere is beginning to overwhelm the Earth's ability to absorb it. To make matters worse, the Amazon is under attack by loggers, farmers, and drought. We're looking at what could be the future of much of the Amazon. It's a, a forest that's burned repeatedly, and the trees that are left are extremely tolerant of drought. They can take a lot of drought. Daniel Nepstead has spent more than 20 years studying how to best conserve the Amazon, often referred to as the lungs of the planet. 2005 was the driest year Nepstead has ever seen. He believes that the climate is changing here, steering rainfall patterns away from the Amazon. When the rain goes away, so does the rainforest. Right now is probably the worst time of the day for the tree. It's having the hardest time getting water all the way up from the ground 30 meters below to this level. It's a hundred feet of vertical draw that these leaves have to do. What Nepstad wanted to learn was how long the trees of the rainforest could survive these droughts. To find the answer, Nepstad didn't climb trees, he dug. What he found surprised him. Instead of a shallow root system, these trees have the capability to extend roots more than 40 feet down in search of water, making them much more resilient to dry conditions than he ever expected. But Nepstead believes these trees have a tipping point. Even that very deep soil will eventually run out of water. If there's not enough rainfall coming into the raining season to recharge it, uh, to supply water to the trees during the dry season, when there's very little rainfall, then they'll start to die. Not only will a large-scale loss of these towering trees destroy a unique ecosystem, it will disrupt the forest's ability to absorb carbon dioxide. And in fact, it may do the reverse. 